production guys. So my project is a prototype vehicle uh, that avoids uh, high temperature zones and distance divided by time. So the velocity here is the sound of the speed. It's 340 uh, meters per second. So when it's come to convert that to uh, milliseconds, uh, it should be 0 0.034. So the time. Normally, the time it goes and bounce back. So it's like double the time to the distance. So that's why we divide it by two. Okay. So here, there are. Uh, I'm using two motors to run this vehicle. So in order to run the motors, you can simply use the Arduino board itself. But I'm going to use uh, L293D uh, uh, motor controller. The advantage of this uh, chip is like you can run up to four motors uh, unidirectionally or you can use two motors bidirectionally. That means go forward and come backward. So the other advantage is like Arduino board is it's only like five volts it's within that train. So if you're using many motors with high power, uh, it's not possible to use just a straight uh, uh, Arduino board. But this uh, chip it can handle up to 36 volts. That means you can power up uh, bigger motors as well. And here you can use one side or both sides. In this project, I'm only using one side. So you, I'm going to use the enable pin and the VCC and then the two ground pins. Two of those are for inputs for the chip, and two of the other pins are for outputs for the motors. Uh, so in that case, you have to power up the motors separately. So you can use basically like any voltage in that case. So the wheels, I was going to use to generate like towing car or something, but it didn't work because the, uh, the speed of the motor should be controlled. Uh, in that case, I bought this from uh, online store uh, because there is a uh, cogwheel mechanical, mechanical system. So it will control the speed of the motor. So in that case, it is very convenient for this project. So, <clears throat> so when it comes to the Arduino code, First, first step is we uh, declare the, uh, all the variables. So, trick pin and code pin, and that's the input and output basically from the uh, uh, sensor. And the motor one and two, these are the two lines uh, goes to the chip, one A and two A. And then uh, we get long, uh, long and integer like two uh, different uh, variables here. <coughs> If you see it here, uh, the same equation I uh, explained to you, uh, this equation, we mention it to the system over here as well. So that's why we use duration and distance. Uh, that's basically the distance from the uh, object, and the duration is the time uh, it's calculated. So within, uh, like, this sensor sends pulse within every 12 seconds, like, stops for two milliseconds and send files, and then stop for another 10 milliseconds. So, and the uh, speed uh, mic of the sensor is gonna capture all these uh, 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 pulses, and then it will do the calculation, and it keeps it in the RAM memory. And then this is the custom loop. You can write any loop here. This is the, uh, the motor-driven part. Uh, if the distance is 50, that means if the distance to the object is 50 centimeters, within 50 centimeters, then this, this while loop is going to activate. That means basically, uh, it sends to signal to the motor chip to activate the uh, motors. And the same way, if the distance is less than 50, then uh, it waits for uh, 10 times the 200 milliseconds, that means two seconds, uh, and then the motor runs backwards. So that's the basic function. <coughs> So the limitations of this one, uh, this uh, this vehicle cannot turn by itself. It just go unidirectional, like it goes and comes back, it's back and forth. Uh, that's one is an advantage, and the other one is uh, these wheels are not designed for a uh, difficult terrain. It's only for like flat surface like this. And the third one is it's not water or heat resistant. So even though I am explaining about high temperature zones, I I'm, I 
really doubt about like the 15 span to a high uh, temperature zone. So, and the recommendations would be it's a, uh, if we can attach to video camera to the system, then if we are exploring like a new uh, area or something, and then we can see and we can get a video feed, then we can uh, do a data movement for this data. And the same thing with the GPS system, uh, then we can map the area and we can see if it's like a fire zone, then we can uh, identify the zone, uh, the fire, how it's in the fire is gone. And the microphone and speaker, that would be helpful if you have a rescue mission. So we can talk to the person and we can, if the idea about how his medical condition and things, so we can get ready about the treatment. And same thing, water and nutrient system. So in a moist condition, this will be working without any issue. And the heat also is the same thing. And the material, so I use like cheap like a toy from Walmart, but if it can be like 3D printed or with a, uh, reliable materials like uh, metal, then it will be working uh, really well. So that's it about the presentation. So if you have any questions, go ahead. Uh, Thanks. So this is a project that me, uh, Ryan, and Kate did on the be made of Arduino alarm clock. So some of the things we'll cover in this presentation is our wiring, our public and tickets, and the code. We'll probably go over some direct uh, code examples and explain how code works. Um, we'll go through some problems we had uh, going through the presentation. Um, We've 3D printed a box here, but we didn't get the dimensions right, so we couldn't fit into it. The breadboard was too big. Um, some of the objectives we had and how we wanted it to look and some of the, the functions. All right, so microcontrollers and microprocessors have become a lot more available to just the average person. So we kind of just came up with the Arduino alarm clock to kind of go along with that with our Arduino project and just wanted to make something practical and usable every day like an alarm clock can actually be used by someone and I'll actually wake up on time. <laughs> so this is just a picture uh, from the top down view of the wiring I've set up. So here we have our three buttons that are connected by resistors and also grounded that are placed in the pins, uh, the digital pins eight, nine, and 10. Uh, over here, we just have the LCD screen directly plugged into the uh, breadboard. It's just made it easier for when we are testing just to know all the cables are, uh, are good and there's no malfunctions there. We have a potentiometer here just to adjust the screen brightness of the LCD. We have our buzzer um, and our RTC just for keeping track of the time. It's all connected to the Arduino board. So some of our project, some of our problems was uh, the design. We wanted to know what we wanted to do, something again, something practical, something that can be used with the Arduino. Arduino does have its limitations on how like complicated you can make a project, um, especially without extra parts. And we kind of wanted to do what we could with the Arduino kit that we had. So that's what we we stuck with the stuff that we had. There. Um, the features we wanted to get alarm clock, just not be able to just tell time. We wanted to be able to do other stuff. So we do have like an alarm function in it. Um, it can set an alarm and the buzzer will go off once it hits a certain time. And we also display the time of day as well with the RTC. Um, the implementation, um, wiring connections were a little bit difficult part of it. Um, we had to figure out what connected directly to what um, and make sure the wires actually worked. So, the coding was also another problem. Um, we can make sure, obviously, all the code worked, but um, we had a lot of difficulties with the coding. It uh, didn't like to work for us, not very well, at least. 
All right, so this here is the initializing of the variable as we got the hours, minutes, and the seconds there. And what this is doing is just setting up the pins on the breadboard so the clock will work. So we got the buzzer and the buttons there being set up, as well as the LCD is all being set up there as well. And then you've got to put in the time that it starts using the code. And then the clock will start working from there. And then uh, once it starts up, it has the screen print off the alarm clock there, the DD3200 clock. Right. Next, we have just the, the loop function that uh, just displays um, the actually is what displays the time because it should, up here it checks as if statements just to check if the buttons are being pressed or not. Um, if it does get pressed, it will work, go into the set alarms function to actually allow you to set the time with the buttons. Otherwise, it will just um, it will check if the hours that is set on the alarm function is equal to the time it currently is, which if it is, the alarm will go off. Otherwise, it will just continually continuously update the time, so it'll just show every second. Uh, and then we just have this serial print line, which is just, there's a few of these in the code that this is just for when you were testing, just to show in the serial monitor of where the code actually was while we were creating it. So this is our display time date here. Um, basically, we use the TMLMS library in the Arduino code to be able to display this up. Um, and this is where we enter our like, time date. So this, this sets our cursor to a specific place on the Arduino. Um, we have like the time, so it shows time, and then it shows the current hour, then a space in between, then the minute, space in between the second, and then we have our cursor set down below that to set the uh, date, and then this shows the current day, and then the month, and then the year. All right, thank you, Paul. Could not have been possible without Paul. Yeah, we helped us with our last one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. how many yeah. related projects this term? But yeah. we're glad, glad he's back on board to help us. Yes, would not have been possible without him. Very important team member. Okay. All right, so now we're going to show the actual the clock running now. So I already, yeah, so I already had it set, so this is like four, it was like 4.30 in the afternoon when I was taking this video, so we just had the time, so 8.40, sorry. Okay, so we had the time, so we just had the time set. And so we can skip ahead like a minute now, because it just it just goes for like 15 minutes, but I wanted to make sure the, the buzzer would actually go on. I don't think there's any audio, so I don't think the buzzer will actually play. It was near, near the end, it's set for, in like six seconds it'll go. And so yeah, it's the alarm goes It's a visual yeah. alarm that it was going off at the selected time. Yeah, I don't use any sound. So the, the buzzer did go off, uh, but <laughs> it might just not be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no sound on things that won't play. And that's it. Thank you. So this is our RFID door locking system. So what is it? It uses uh, radio frequency identification to unlock and lock a door. And on the, uh, the circuit in the door, there's user feedback with a LCD screen and also a buzzer, and it's a simple operate. And also, what radio frequency identification is? It's like we have these tags there that have like they kind of store like a string on it, and uh, when we scan it, it checks the string to see if it's a match for like in the array, I mean in the code to see if it's a match. If it's a match, then it'll unlock the door, and if not, then it won't unlock the door. So. Some of the parts we use, so we use the Arduino Mega since it was in the kit, and also included in the kit was the RFID sensor, and it came with two different tags. So it allows for one that will work and one that won't work when we do a demonstration. And also we use the LCD screen for user feedback. It says unlocking door, scan tag, lock door, like wrong card, stuff like that. And also we used a buzzer, which just whenever you also of course we use jumper cables on the breadboard just to uh, help interface to the Arduino. Um, so like some like um, challenges that uh, we had doing the um, secret build and solve the, was the uh, power supply issue. So like uh, basically the um, LCD only works with the uh, five uh, five volt. Uh, 
and like I didn't know that uh, before, so like I was trying, so I, uh, we were trying with like the uh, V-in, and like, it wouldn't light up, um, 3.3 volt as well, and um, like, it wouldn't light up, so yeah, there was some issues there, but also by the uh, wire connection, there were like some like uh, loose uh, wires, so so like some components uh, won't work, um, yeah, and high quality um, communication, um, code issues, there were, there were like some like uh, syntax errors, and the code was like uh, really uh, working. So uh, for this demo, uh, we have like two codes. The uh, first one is to like scan the um, um, UID, and the uh, second one is for the door unlock. So like for the demo, I'm gonna just upload this. Um, are you two first? Yeah, so I'm just like um, scan it first real quick so I have the um, like the eight bit code so like so like I put it in the uh, next code to so like unlock the uh, door. So like it basically shows like eight bits, and then like uh, from like there like input that in the uh, next code to like. Which will help us like on the big um, door. So we're taking like that string that's on this Card. tag and we're putting it to the next set of codes. So this one we didn't scan in, we don't know what string it is. So when this one scans, it won't allow access to the door. So scan this yeah. one. So it says access granted, unlocking door. And also on the back, there's a servo motor that's connected. There's an actual like lock here, kind of like a fence lock, but I don't think the servo motor's powerful uh, enough to actually turn it. To work, yeah. So then scanning this one, it says access denied, and it doesn't move the servo motor at all. So like this one is like, you know, like, uh, so like unlock, you know, this like locks it to work. So that's it? Yeah, okay. that's it. Okay. Uh, we need for better pet feeders. As you can see, there's a lot of pet feeders out in the market right now. And everyone should, everyone with a pet should use a pet feeder because if you ever need to go on vacation, you know, can't like ha always have a dog babysitter. You're gonna you let technology do its thing and get a pet feeder. But most of these pet feeders have a huge problem with them, which we're gonna address in the upcoming slide. Uh, we are the main part of our project is the Equal Mega 2560, of course. Uh, this couple bit of information with the Mega, but we only use about like. 10 to 8 pins. Yeah, we didn't use the full capacity. The uh, components we used, uh, so we used the Arduino Omega for the main controller board, and then we used uh, the mini breadboard to connect all the wiring, and um, then we used the ultrasonic sensor for a distance uh, sensor to trigger the water fountain, and we used the button for a manual trigger on the feeding function, and the 3D printing model to uh, funnel the food and a servo motor to move the trapdoor latch for the food, and uh, a relay uh, as a uh, electrical switch to turn on and off the fountain, and a diode as a flyback diode for the relay, and a transistor to help control the relay, or to control the relay in general, and a nine volt power supply to power the water fountain, and the water fountain itself, and a RTC module, real-time clock module, to uh, for a feeding function at whatever time is specified. Yeah. In the beginning, we also had the ultrasonic sensor to feed, but we thought it'd be a better idea to just do fountain because we don't want to be feeding every five minutes. Uh, yeah. If you know, skip the slide. This slide is supposed to make it. Yeah, that's the key. So the problem with 9 out of 10 pet feeders nowadays is 
they just don't take account uh, into water for pets. Like pets need water as well, right? Just like humans. So studies show that pets can survive up to five days without food, but only 72 hours without water. So we made a pet feeder with a water pet. So you don't forget pets hydration. Automatic pet feeder plus water pet. Sir. Using real time distance measuring. What a fact. Uh, yeah, so the initial testing, we actually started with just the button and the server motor to make sure that our 3D printed model worked. And then we decided to add an ultrasonic sensor to check the distance where the pet was. If the pet came 30 centimeters or closer to the sensor, it would automatically feed and the water pan would go up. But then we decided to do just the water pan, not feeding every time it came close. And we also added the REC module so you can feed at specific times, like 4 p.m., 3 p.m., whichever time you want it to be. And finally, we added the power supply to power the water pan. So uh, the way our pet feeder is better than conventional pet feeders, as Aaron mentioned already, conventional pet feeders don't have a watering function, and uh, conventional pet feeders usually have a, their own small integrated bowl. With this design, you can use any size dish, any original dish your pets use. And uh, this, uh, the original conventional pet feeders are expensive and bulky, and this one is very DIY. Anybody can do it if they have the same kit as us. Uh, Water pan as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, this one's very modular in design. You can plug any water fountain into it that uh, isn't too overpowered. And as I said already, you can use any bowl with it. And so, yeah, the code used this is actually like our code, but it's kind of blurry right now. But yeah, so most of our code is focused around making the button and the ultrasonic sensor and the relay and the RTC out to make the server motor work. So that's what it's all focused on. And yeah, we don't need to get too much into it because most of the code is already explained in the previous. Uh, upgrading, yeah. So by the end, we realized that this breadboard was actually way too big and it didn't look nice. So we downgraded it to a smaller uh, breadboard and rewired it all at nice mesh. And yeah, it makes it made it look a lot more nicer and cleaner and convenient to carry around. Demonstration pictures. Next slide. Yeah, the so the industry for the pet feeders uh, at one point two billion, and it's going to go to five point eleven billion by twenty twenty eight. Because of COVID, it went down because people weren't traveling and you wouldn't be using pet feeders now. Staying home, feeding their own pets. Next. And thank you. Thanks, guys. Questions later. Next one. And. These are our references. Our references. Now we'll do a demo, a quick demonstration. Quick demo guys. So if you wave your hand in front of the ultrasonic yeah. sensor, you can see the water fan activates and it currently activates for one minute, but you can adjust the time for how long you want the water fan to turn on. And whenever you want the food to dispense, there's a button right here. You can press it and the thing will open up for several seconds to let the water food come out. And then there's the RGC module. And the RGC module will put it at whichever specific time you want. And the time right now is not ideal. But everything else works. We can do it with this bottle to make it look nice. Press the button. Press the button. Oh, one came out. Okay, two came out. I guess you need smaller food. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It works. It works. It works. Maybe make the hole bigger next time. Yeah. Anyways, yes. And that's our presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Alright, so for what I did for my Arduino project is I did a keypad lock. So, introduction. So the entire point of this project was to make a servo motor powered lock to the use of a keypad. And with this, all it does is you just type in the right password and it just moves the lock with the servo motor. So for this, I originally identified the key project requirements, so security and adaptability. And to uh, define the overall structure, which was integrating the Arduino using the keypad and servo motor. So here was my circuit originally. I apologize for the uh, 
the low quality images, but you can see here, this was how I set up the Arduino with the, the lock and the servo, and then here was the keypad connected to that. And for the code, now the code is really small, I apologize. But in this code here, what I do is I originally set up the servo motor and I define the password as being 888 for simplicity, and I initialize variables. And I specify the keypad layout and pin connections in the code. And with that, I also assign pins for the servo motor. And then I connect to the servo motor and I set the initial lock position in the code. And then I continuously check the keypad uh, input and it resets if the, if the star or pound key is pressed. And it verifies if the password is correct and it will unlock if it is. So there, this should work with the video. I don't know if I just might have to go for the computer and, and play it, but. Oh, it's not playing, is it? Okay, one second. Has the video on YouTube. I think you should hit like next slide. I think that's what does it maybe. Okay, so it's it's still up there. Okay, cool. Alright, sweet. <laughs> so as you can see here. It is a fairly makeshift. I had a limited, limited, <laughs> limited resources, so I pretty much just screwed it into a cardboard and just did it from there. So the issues that I faced, there were several, there was a lot of issues when I was setting this up originally. So most of my issues came from actually, not so much in the code and programming, it really came from actually getting the servo motor to move a lot. So I had to set up the servo motor in the correct position where I could keep enough tension on the wire that I used where it would actually move the lock back and forth. And I actually had to make sure that the wire was strong enough gauge to work as well. So yeah, so it was, the degrees was like another issue too. I had that went from 90, see if 90 degrees would work in rolls, and I tried 180, and 180 it proved to be too much movement as it would actually make the lock just, it, the, the range of movement was too much and it would actually ruin the entire thing. Yeah, so the mechanical aspects of the entire project was really the main thing that I faced as an issue. And in conclusion, yeah, it, it came out to where it was able to work in a very makeshift manner, but we had something that worked. Does anyone have any questions? Um, good. Is that a project? Um, very long name. Three in one voice control of stuff for avoiding temperatures and humidity. That was like the worst name you could use, but yeah, that's it. At least all the things though. So it's like a uh, robot that um, senses temperature, voice control from an app. On an Android phone. Okay. okay. So, yeah, this slideshow presentation of the robot analyzes the purpose of the project, the breakdown of the design, and the hardware and software components of the project as well. So, um, this is the overview of the three main things we're going to speak about. And uh, I'll just give a rough introduction to the project. So purpose, yeah, um, it's kind of a mix of um, two things that we love. So like a car, making a robot was kind of fun with the obstacle avoiding qualities and then adding a temperature sensor to it as well. Um, that kind of brings us to scenario in like cases in like industries or like um, high temperature zones. Um, this can help to give feedback on the different um, temperature of different um, places in the industry. Like a really large industry, can, this can come in really handy, um, knowing the temperature of different parts of the industry to kind of monitor um, the whole industry as well. And maybe in like homes as well, you can know the different temperature of different rooms in case you're kind of too lazy to like, go about the house. Uh, this can help as well. And uh, yeah, we do this all by ourselves, and that's it. Yeah, so the hardware, um, I was mostly going to work on the hardware, where he did most of the software, so 
the original owner. It's kind of like the brain of the whole um, the whole project because that's where we do all the connection. That's where the Bluetooth module is connected to. That's where the server model. That's where the ultrasonic sensor and that's where I connected the um, model driver to. So I had to use a lot of jumper cables because we had a lot of um, we had a lot of components we had to give power to. But the Arduino Uno only has one five one five voltage supply, so I had to use a breadboard to pass on five voltage to all the to all the other components like the server model, the um, the ultrasonic sensor, the Bluetooth module, and the Bluetooth module and the um, and the and the temperature sensor. Yeah. So the main use of the Arduino Uno was to make me able to put all the stuff together and act as the brain for everything to be able to work together. The ultrasonic sensor, it kind of, how the ultrasonic sensor works is it sends out uh, um, ultrasonic waves, it sends out ultrasonic waves toward an object and when it, when it hits the object and bounces back, it measures the distance and how long it takes for the object to return to the ultrasonic sensor. Then that distance, we set it to be able to know when it's uh, close to, like how close it is to an object. When it measures the distance between the object, it's between the object, the wave bounced off, the distance that it took, how long it took for the wave to get back to the electronic sensor. That's what we use to know when it's close to an object and it stops and changes direction. The motor driver, the motor driver serves as a, I could have used, uh, I, I could have just connected, just connected it normally, but I had to use the motor driver because of the, we had four wheels and to use four wheels, it makes it easier because it has two, it has a, it, it's able to make you use four wheels connected to the Arduino board. So, and if you make a mistake in the connection, because when I did it at first, I put in the wires, like I flipped it around. So when it was meant to go forward, it was going backward. So you have to make sure the wires are connected correctly. So, and um, the two the two left tires are connected to the two um, connections right, right at the top of this, while the right ones are connected to the back of it. So at first I put it as the first two here connected to this, then the first, the last two here connected to this, but then it was just misbehaving, just going around in circles, which was not right. So I had to flip it around and change the chain connection. And server model. When it's powered on, the server model is able to stay in a particular um, position. It takes whatever signal, whatever information it gets from the sensor, it takes that information and uses to know when to turn and how to turn. So I set the server motor to always be at 90 degrees, which means it's always going to be straight. So if it senses something in front of it, this, the server motor is programmed to turn to the left, turn to the right, and look for a direction that's free and go to the direction. So the server motor is very useful in this because it's when it's powered on, you can't turn the, you can't turn it anyway. It's always going to be facing straight, and it turns when only when something is in front of it. And now the Bluetooth module. So we wanted to make it so we could power it on from the phone. So there's a switch here also. So the switch has to be on for us to use the phone because I mean, there's kind of like some bulbs they sell at Dollar Rammer, the ones you put in like a, a remote control bulb, but you, you put it in, but still the light has to be on for you to be able to like um, turn it on and turn it off. The switch has to be on. So that's kind of how this works. The switch is on, but we can still power it on and off from the phone. So you can just turn it on, put it down, then you can use your phone to control it. And that makes it kind of easier to work. So that's what the Bluetooth module is for. We use the Bluetooth module to connect to the phone, which makes us able to send information, send, send commands straight to the Arduino Uno. And the DC motors, those are the four wheels we have here. They're um, powered by direct current, straight from the five volts that I put on, straight from the five volts on the, um, on the motor board, so yeah. All right, I will be speaking on the software part. So the first part is the Arduino code. Um, yeah, so I didn't show all the code because it's uh, like 200 lines or something. So I'm just showing the loop, which is probably the most, the most important part of the code. Um, we have some other stuff. There's a lot of libraries, like uh, the new pin library, um, the AF model library, and the server model library. And every other parameter has a set above. Um, but basically, what the code does is first of all, check. So, this serial, the serial port where the Bluetooth is plugged into, check if it, um, there's incoming data or bytes available. So, if there is, um, it runs this whole body. Now, you can see the serial control, that's just an integer value. And that was created by me because if you wanted to be able to be controlled from the phone when you hit on, this just checks if there's a button click. If you wanted to keep on running, 
you have to introduce like some integer value. So when that button is clicked, I keep increasing that value until the off button is clicked. And then I set that value back, back to zero and the code stops. So the incoming value just reads um, whatever um, is passed from the phone. So if it's on, it reads um, 48. And if it's off, it, it, it reads 49. And uh, it runs code depending on whatever value it is. And here, of course, you can see the AND serial control here just to make sure you can't press the off button if the serial control is never on. So um, this my right 90 just um, change the head of the ultrasonic sensor to the left and right. Um, there's a delay. And then here we have the DHT11 module, so that's the temperature sensor. Um, it basically just reads the temperature and um, prints it out. So the serial dot print is going to print it back to the Bluetooth, which is going to send it to the Android and display the temperature value on the phone. And uh, this piece of code here is used to check if the distance to the next object is um, lesser than the collision distance, and then change that according to that. So yeah, the rest of it is um, we use the MIT App Inventor, which is used to um, create a mobile app for the Android, and we use TeamSpeak and MATLAB, which is a, a cloud. This is a cloud service for say um, storing data, and this is used to run the analytics on the temperature data. But yeah, some future modifications you could incorporate this with sensors at home, use a GPS for location and stair climbing as well. All right, that's all. Thank you. Any questions? Um, so we both have a video here, but we also gonna turn it on. So play the video then. First I have to turn on the switch. So I don't know if you can see the phone screen. Um, we're gonna connect it to the periphery to the Android phone. See that here it says connected. Then I can use the button to turn it on. And then it does its thing. I don't know if you can, you can see right here, it, it reads the temperature from back right here. And uh, there is the graph data for the temperature and the time, different values. And uh, yeah, you can turn it off with the off button. I don't want to shoot stuff now, right? Yeah. Project so far. Uh, so we did an electronic safe. We built these in Arduino and just uh, the components. We got the component list we'll get to there. Uh, I'm Nick Butler, as you know. Yeah, so the idea for it was just like a simple design for a safe. Uh, that's not very secure at all, but. Yeah, it's just Ooh, just the idea of using like the three components, we, the three major components of like the LCD and the uh, the keypad and the servo motor to try and make something to keep anything any valuable safe, kind of like a lock. It could work outdoors too. So yeah, it's password secure. It uh, 
it won't open, the serial number will not move under any circumstance unless the correct password is entered. If the incorrect password gets entered, like nothing, nothing happens, it just stays where it is. So why we went with this is because it's pretty practical. You know, we could use this outside. You know, maybe if we actually 3D printed a case for it and not had a cardboard box, it could smash with one punch. Uh, it's also user friendly. The LCD kind of explains you what to do, what you have to do, if it's open, if the password's entered incorrect, stuff like that. And also, it was, uh, it was a good learning experience to put all the pieces together, figure it out. It was fun not doing all that as well. Yeah, yeah so the components we use, we use the, the 16 by 2 LCD screen that was included in our Arduino kit. Um, that's just used to display, like, I think currently it says safe closed enter password or something. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's just used to display what's currently happening with the safe. Um, we use the matrix keypad, which is used in your password, so there's a lot of options there. Like, you can change whatever you want. And uh, obviously, the servo, servo motor is connected to, uh, to everything, so that way, when the correct password is entered, it moves and unlocks the safe. So, so there was a rough design. I kind of did it in your head. Um, yeah, pretty much how it works is just the keypad is hooked up to the Arduino, the analog and the silicon LCD and the servo as well. And this is a potentiometer that just controls the screen, the LCD screen, and how it works. And pretty much just, yeah, you just input the password here and then we'll just move the servo. And now for the code. So for the code, we, um, while we were scouring, we were trying to figure out how to implement a password for the Arduino, but we actually found a handy library called just call password that pretty much makes a method for you. Uh, so that's just kind of really simple enough. In the code, so when you do it in the code, you just do password, password, and you just put really whatever you want, any number you want. Um, we have a check password method that, well yeah, like I said, it pretty much checks the password. It runs the, uh, on that password library, there's another method that says evaluate, and if it checks it, so it's just an if else statement. If the password is inputted correctly, it'll uh, open up. When we do the demonstration, I'll show that. And if it's not entered correctly, well, it just doesn't do anything. It just stays as it is and inputs that um, the password was incorrect. And the LCD is all just hooked up, pretty much just displaying it, depending on what the if else statement produces. And yeah, the server also is pretty much all hooked up to that, just one nested if else statement. Okay, so I'll have a lot of demonstrations. Show how it works, I guess. Right now it's closed. You can do password. One, two, three, very secure. See, it opens. Yeah, you have all your values. Yeah. Yeah. We just hit, hit the A button again. Yeah. Post up again. It's a pretty, pretty simple idea. Can you yes. demonstrate the game? One more time? Yeah, yeah one more time. We have the password. One, two, three. Hit A. Try and correct password. Done. You hit A again, the locks. If you do an incorrect password, let's just do some random. We'll say, say on the LCD. Well, it just won't pop up anything because the password's incorrect and it won't do it. So as long as the password's not correct, it won't move. Yeah. So some of the use cases for this would be obviously like practical use of an actual safe, like Nick was saying earlier, if we actually had a proper safe and not a cardboard box, oh, you, could, uh, you could actually take this project and reuse it for that. Um, it could also, like I said earlier, be used for a door lock. It uh, serves the same functionality of like password unlocking something that can be used for many different things. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys.
bulk relief, I was trying to design different components that I could add to an Arduino so that it would all combine into one kind of a smart grooming system so that you could have a light above your desk, maybe a light next to the bed, stuff like that. But again, I kind of scrapped the idea. So what I ended up with is the motion sensor, the TIR motion sensor that we used for our project. That was what I was using initially. It's supposed to be centimeter range, except for, I don't know if I had the sensors wrong or what, but I could only get it to work like a meter, not even a meter. And even then it seemed very finicky and it wouldn't do what I wanted to do. So I ended up changing to the uh, ultrasonic sensor, which ended up working a lot better. But the TIR sensor is what I had in mind to set up in each corner of the room and then it would sense where you are and the code would be programmed to, if one sensor picked up movement in that area, then it would go based off that. And you would have the certain TIR sensors plugged into, let's say, slot 10 and 9. And if it was plugged into that one, that would be the bed slot. And it would sense that, take the input, turn off the light or turn on the light, depending on if it sensed motion in that area. But because the TIR sensor didn't work, I ended up going to the motion sensor, but that's just for this part of the project. So the ultra sensor, ultrasonic sensor, uh, a lot more success with it. Uh, whenever I did the part of the lab, it didn't work. I couldn't get the PRS into the work at all. It just constantly sensed movement. So I switched to this one. Uh, max range for the ultrasonic sensor is supposed to be four meters. I could only get it to do about a meter. Like if I stand in front of there, it's not going to go to four meters. It's only going to go about a meter. Um, it's a lot easier to use because it's smaller scale as well. Uh, so I designed it to be something useful that everybody would get use out of bedroom and you want to have a smart home system, obviously you can have like an Alexa or a Google Home or something and it'll be exactly that but a lot easier. But So the main idea was the area lighting. I wanted to have it so that if you're going to bed, like when you guys go to bed, you have to turn the lights off in your house. I wanted it to not be something that you have to interact with, that you could just go to one corner of your house and it would turn off lights for the rest of your house. That was the idea that I wanted to have. But again, I scrapped it. I could get an LED to work, so it would turn on an LED based on location, except for obviously the LED is in the light of the room, so that's why I scrapped that idea. The power supply also, I ran into issues. For some reason, the 9 volt power supply that comes with the kit and battery, just plugging it into the board, I couldn't get enough power to get the project to work, so plugging it into the computer did get it actually to turn on and work properly, but every single time I used a 9 volt battery, it wouldn't work. I'm not sure if I need 12 volt batteries or more. But I ended up just switching to this, plugging it into a computer for the power source. Uh, so the whole idea was location sensing. So you would set up a grid in your room, and depending on if you're in this section, it would sense that you're on that section, possibly turn on the TV. If you leave that section and maybe go out of the room, it would sense that no one's in the room, and it would turn off the light, turn off the TV, and turn off everything else in the room. But again, it's a lot more complex than I thought it was going to be. Uh, so the final project, which is what I have here, is only a piece of the system. It's pretty, uh, pretty sad looking, but ultimately what it is, is just a motion sensor garbage can for storage. So whatever you want to put inside, you would go over, pick up. 60 seconds away, close. So if you want to throw something else in there, same thing, sense of motion, put that in there, 60 seconds, it closes. So, I was hoping to have automation like that just for sensing movement and work throughout the rest of the project, but again, way more complicated than I thought it was going to be. So you can use a, gar a garbage can, you can use it as whatever you want, but it's small, portable, put it on your desk, and that's it. References, I had the picture I used came off a website just for a floor plan for a house, and then my own website, which isn't real, I just made it up, so that's it. All right, so my project is the baby monitoring system with Arduino. Um, introduce yourself. I'm Josh. Uh, you guys should or might know me. Uh, I'm Josh with Retinol. I'm currently in your class, class group. And uh, I'm doing the baby, mo baby monitoring system. The whole purpose of this project was to immediately provide parents and caregivers with real-time updates on their baby's well-being. Right, because uh, I have a baby, and there's certain aspects of my life that could be a lot easier if I had, you know, simpler stuff like this. You know. Anyway, this is my little.